Hello there and uh, good afternoon. I'm your host, Abdurrahim Kashour, and this is the L24, the daily special coverage. Vladimir Putin will hold bilateral meetings this week with leaders of China, India, Turkey, and Iran. The Kremlin said, as the Russian leader seeks to use a summit in Uzbekistan to counter the diplomatic isolation he has, and Ukraine forces on the battleground have recaptured more than 6,000 square kilometers in the east and the south of the country so far this month. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said Western officials said it's too early to say whether this is a turning point in the war, with one comparing Ukraine's recent successes to a sovereign goal before halftime. The US is preparing another package of aid to Ukraine, according to John Kirby, the spokesman for the National Security Council cited a shift of uh, momentum in the war. President Joe Biden said it was too early to tell if the Ukrainian counteroffensive amounted to a turning point in the conflict. On the other side, Portugal's Prime Minister Antonio Costa has urged France to stop blocking the proposed meat cast pipeline across the Pyrenees, noting it would help Central and Eastern Europe wind themselves off of the Russian gas. To analyze all this information, I'm drawn live from Portugal by Mrs. Sandra Fernandez, researcher at a research center in political science, and Halle Schlenger, vice president of the Schiller Institute from Germany. Gentlemen, my lady, thank you so much for being with us in this discussion. A short break, and we start our debate. And before we delve into a discussion, let me read for you this piece of information that contains a report. Ukrainian troops have consolidated the gains made in recent days and claim to have recaptured more than three towns in the Kharkiv region, raising flags in cities and towns occupied by Russian troops for six months. The war in Ukraine is entering a new phase. After the consolidation of a major offensive by the Ukrainian army in recent days, which on Tuesday continued its advances in Kharkiv province in the northeast of the country, raising flags in the towns and villages that were held by the Russians. The president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, affirmed that the Ukrainian troops have recovered since the beginning of September more than 6,000 square kilometers of the territory occupied by the Russian forces. As for now, stabilization measures are completed in an area of 4,000 square kilometers. An elaborated area of about the same size where stabilization measures are still ongoing. Remnants of occupation forces and saboteur groups are being uncovered. Collaborators are being arrested for security is re-established. Russia on Tuesday said its army successfully destroyed several Ukrainian arsenals in the past days. Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Kolnashinkov said at a daily briefing on Tuesday that in the past 24 hours, the Russian aerospace forces used high-precision guided weapons to strike Ukrainian targets, while its army aviation and artillery units destroyed five Ukrainian arsenals storing rockets and artillery shells. Russian air, ballistic and artillery forces are carrying out massive strikes against Ukrainian armed forces units in all operational areas. Ukrainian forces launched their counteroffensive in early September, apparently taking the Russian army by surprise. According to Ukrainian authorities, its soldiers have recaptured important swaths of territory and cities such as Izium, Kopyansk, and Balaklia in the northeast, and some 500 square kilometers in the Kherson region to the south. So, uh, Mr. Howley, based on uh, the information given in this report, and Ukraine is on the Russian borders almost, and they are gaining a daily advance against the Russians. So how Ukraine is making these counterattacks? Can we say that finally this is the effect of uh, the US and Germany, UK backup and weapons deliveries? 
Well, I think it's two things. That's that's a big part of it. The, the fact that the weapons have continued to pour in, that there's logistical support, there's GPS support. Uh, and some people are saying there are NATO and U.S. advisors working directly with the war plans and working with the Ukrainian military. And remember, the Ukrainian military has been involved for eight years in training by NATO. So that's a factor. The other factor is that the Russian forces were spread very thin. They took a whole area of uh, eastern Ukraine. They were not prepared for this uh, attack, this counterattack. The question is, will it be able to be sustained by the Ukrainian forces? They've lost a lot of soldiers in this, as, as they admit, especially in Kherson, which they admit was a failure. Uh, whether they can hold on to what they have, whether they're falling into a trap for Russia, we'll find out in the next couple of days. But I think the danger here is that the escalation uh, is taking place, which will probably cause a Russian response, including hitting what they hadn't been doing before, such as power plants, transportation centers, knocking out the rail systems in Ukraine and so on. So there's a, a real danger of an escalation. And before the, uh, the uh, turning point is proclaimed, we'll have to see how this uh, plays out over the next days and weeks. Very good uh, points you have raised, Mr. Howley. Uh, coming to you, Ms. Sandra, Ukraine is making progress with no doubts. This latest counteroffensive pushed the Russians to step back and try different solutions, such as cutting power stations. So what is your interpretation to the situation in general in Ukraine? And what to be expected in the coming days? Would Ukraine allies such as US, UK, Germany deliver more weapons to Zelensky troops after this success? Good afternoon. Well, uh, I think that what we are witnessing today, this uh, counteroffensive from the Ukrainians, is something that we expected to happen. It's a result, in fact, of the backup that uh, Ukrainians have been having and also the, the result of their own merit, of the quality of their uh, leadership. So we were expecting that at some point the Ukrainians would be able to uh, manage a counteroffensive, and it was expected to be in late summer or in the autumn. So, but I would not interpret this uh, moment um, as a, a kind of new phase of the war, as a, a clear victory. Uh, it shows that the support to Ukraine has been uh, working out and answering directly to your uh, question, um, the, um, the financial and military support to Ukraine is planned by the US, by the UK, so we can expect that it will continue. The Ukrainians are proving that they are being able to take advantage of the offers that they have been receiving to fight this war against Russia. But at the same time, uh, even if we notice uh, um, problems on the Russian side that we have been noticing since the beginning of the war, it doesn't mean that the Russians will not be able to, in fact, reorganize and, 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 uh, and improve uh, their position. So I would be cautious on the interpretation of this counteroffensive, offensive it's happening. It's true that the Russian uh, troops have been uh, having difficulties. Uh, for, in, for instance, they are leaving a lot of prisoners behind. I think that even the Ukrainians do not know what to do with so much uh, prisoners. Um, but still, as my uh, colleague was uh, saying, I would totally agree, we need to see uh, the developments. Plus, the um, uh, territories that have been requested by, uh, um, by the Ukrainians, uh, of course, it's important. I think it's mostly important for their moral, for their um, um, uh, uh, conviction that they can win this war. This is something that Zelensky, President Zelensky, has been uh, um, very vocal about it. But uh, in fact, the territories that the Russians have been able to conquer in the last three months are not that much in terms of, um, of uh, extension. So the reconquest is also on a relatively small amount of territory. And the Russians still control most of what they have been controlling until now. But in fact, Ukrainians have been mm -hmm. uh, willing to pay a price for, the, for this moment. They have been heavily attacked. They have suffered losses. But they are showing that they are able to read uh, the Russian forces right and they are able to use the materials that they have been receiving. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Thank you so much for this explanation. Coming to you, Mr. Halley, Ukraine's advances pose a question for the whole world right now. Can Kiev actually win or 
uh, this is another strategy from Putin and his troops to go back for another move forward. Well, I think what Professor Fernandez just said is very important to keep in mind. Can they sustain this offensive? And what was the point of the counteroffensive? Note that it occurred as there was another meeting at Rammstein Air Base in Germany, where the defense secretary from the United States, uh, General Austin, was there to have a discussion, consultation. Uh, and then immediately after that, Secretary of State Blinken, uh, Victoria Nuland, who was one of the key people in the coup in 19, uh, 2014, uh, and also Annalena Baerbock, the German foreign minister, went to Kiev to promise more weapons. Now, the problem is that while this feeds the morale of the Ukrainian forces, it also tends to mean that they'll be less likely to negotiate. What's necessary now is a negotiated settlement. The idea that you're going to continue this war, that the West can continue to pour in this volume of weapons, there are reports of Western countries drawing down their stockpiles of weapons. And then we have the whole other factor, which is the inflation in the West, the sanctions, the effect of the sanctions as a backfire, uh, energy shortages, the, the cold winter coming, uh, the growing opposition within forces in Europe to this continuing war. Instead of continuing an offensive, there should be an agreement to pull back. And not just on the Russian side, because so far the Ukrainians have proven to be unwilling to meet uh, Mr. Putin's suggestion that there be a discussion. And this leaves open the whole question of what was behind this, namely the refusal of Ukraine to follow through on the Minsk Accords. Mm -hmm. So I, I think anyone who thinks this is about to end is making a big mistake. The Russians have uh, much greater capacity to continue this. The question is, will NATO and the West keep pouring in the support that they have so far? Mm -hmm. Perfectly understood. Now, a way of Ukraine and a better ground. Let's move on to a different topic. President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has announced that this Wednesday she will travel to Kiev to show the EU support for the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and to guarantee that the country will have unrestricted access to the single European market. Von der Leyen delivered this Wednesday before the European Parliament the annual speech on the State of the Union which has focused on the war and on energy crisis and economy measures to, con to counteract the effect of the European economy. It is about autocracy against democracy. And I stand here with a conviction that with the necessary courage and with the necessary solidarity, Putin will fail and Ukraine and Europe will prevail. Europe's solidarity with Ukraine will remain unshakable. From day one on, Europe has stood at Ukraine's side with weapons, with funds, with hospitalities for refugees, and with the toughest sanctions the world has ever seen. As uh, she said, Miss Sandra, Putin will fade. Well, rather, a way of political discourse that crippled the, UA, uh, the EU recently. As a European, Miss Sandra, what do you think that should be done to get over this ener uh, energy problem? And do you think Europe is still capable of aiding Ukraine with more money and weapons deliveries? Don't you think EU countries have reached their limits? Well, uh, the discourse from uh, the President of the European Commission was quite long. It was um, about 50 minutes discourse. And um, uh, at least at the official level, what we can see is that the message is, and it was um, uh, the, the main um, uh, driver of uh, van der Leyen's, uh, uh, Mrs. van der Leyen's discourse this morning, uh, it was about saying that it is possible to support Ukraine and at the same time, um, uh, provide the Europeans with good quality of life, meaning to recover their, uh, uh, their uh, um, level of life, let's say. And of course, it's very ambitious. And um, the measures that have been announced uh, are still to be approved in detail. So let's see uh, once again what the Europeans will be able, about, able to, uh, to decide as EU member states and as individual states as well. 
And uh, my perceptions, it's, of course, it's a challenge, it's difficult, but there is no way out of this because the political decision has been taken that um, uh, uh, the, energy, the European energy market needs to be cut from Russia. So this is the road to, to this. And also the fact that um, at the same time, the European Union member states need to uh, manage a green economy transition. So uh, taking care of the environment. And this needs to be done at the same time when in the immediate uh, context, families mm -hmm. need to be supported because we have a high risk of energy poverty for European families at the, uh, at the moment and for them also for the United Kingdom families. So, of course, the challenges are big, but one of the messages of van der Leyen was that uh, the European Union has demonstrated that it has been quite slow in mm -hmm. uh, shifting uh, policies and paradigms. But since the pandemic, it has also proven that it is able to be solider and also faster in taking decisions. Mm -hmm. But this is, a, this is really a big, big challenge. And um, the measures that have been announced and was, were very awaited, namely by the Portuguese government, mm -hmm. have now to be uh, uh, decided in detail. Perfect. We will come to this point. Uh, Mr. Hell, the European countries since the beginning of, the, of this world, the so-called special military operation, have been holding monthly meetings with no vision ahead for a better solution. They are only focused on how to aid Ukraine and destroy Putin's economy. And this is why Europe now is witnessing this energy crisis now. They are simply guided blindly to a cliff and no one knows how tall it is. Don't you agree on that? Well, let me start with just one, the first thing that von der Leyen said about support for democracy. This is hypocrisy. In the Ukraine, opposition parties have been shut down and opposition uh, leaders jailed. Opposition press has been shut down. The Ukrainian national security forces have drawn up a list of hundreds of people that they're calling information terrorists who should be treated as war criminals. I'm on that list for advocating peaceful negotiations. So the idea that this is the great rally for democracy, I, I think, has to be called out as a fraud. And the censorship in the West as to what actually is going on is also something that has to be addressed. Now, one other point on democracy is you have the what's being imposed on Europe is energy scarcity. And they're trying to blame it on Putin. But this goes back to policies that were adopted over the last five years, including at the Paris Climate Conference, the, the Glasgow Conference, uh, the shift to so-called alternative energy sources uh, predated the Russian operations in Ukraine. Now, Putin has described this as self-inflicted wounds. And I think that's something people have to look at. Here in Germany, my utility bills have gone up 400% since last uh, February. The ability of people to pay these bills is challenged. Von der Leyen, in talking about capping the rates and the, the so-called EU policy, it's not going to work. Why? Because they won't go after the other part of the problem of energy costs skyrocketing, which is the spot markets where speculation is going on on oil prices, regardless of what the actual cost of oil is. So they're trying to use the war to impose a new agenda on Europe. And I think it's, it's going to trigger tremendous reaction, unrest, it's going to be a hot autumn. We're already seeing that with demonstrations in Prague, demonstrations coming up this week in, in, in Austria this weekend, uh, labor unrest in the United Kingdom, uh, the continuation of farm demonstrations. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's going to be extremely difficult for them to push this through using the war as the excuse. Very good point. As always, you have raised, Mr. Howley. Now, let's tackle uh, uh, precisely one country, which is Portugal, that is suffering from the energy crisis. The increase in energy bills in Portugal is affecting uh, ceramic sector in sectors in Portugal with cost of gas and electricity bills skyrocketing for many companies in the country. This comes as Portugal's Prime Minister Antonio Costa urging Paris or Paris to stop blocking the proposed mid cast gas pipeline across the Pyrenees, noting it would help Central and Eastern Europe diversify or rather diversity their energy sources. 
Ms. Sandra, previously in the last month, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez stressed the need to improve energy links between the Iberian Peninsula and the rest of Europe. Macron of France is receiving a similar call from Portugal's Prime Minister now. Don't you think France is being kind of selfish to keep blocking this mid cast pipeline for environmental and economic uh, viability reasons, as they claim? Or this is not uh, the right solution? Well, I would say that uh, the Iberic Peninsula is, uh, uh, is now uh, getting more attention and uh, the issue of connecting the peninsula to the rest of Europe is seen now as an opportunity from the Portuguese government that sees Portugal in this uh, crisis context as having an opportunity to participate in transition, energy transition, so climate and energy uh, and digital transition as well. So I, I would say that this is a, a question that uh, shall be overcome uh, with some facility because um, Portugal is really offering uh, uh, solutions uh, based on uh, its deep water port in Sinus, that is actually where it receives most of the liquidified natural gas that could be transited uh, to, uh, through this new pipeline. So the construction in Portugal is already happening. And Portugal had also to overcome some environmental issues in the in the route of the construction of the pipeline. These questions always arise in the constructions of the pipeline. And I would not politicize the French uh, um, uh, discourse and uh, also the fact that uh, the Portuguese uh, prime minister has a very good dialogue with France. So uh, I would say that anyway, the pipeline will take time to construct. And what the Portuguese government has been saying uh, adamantly is that he, he, it really wants to help the rest of Europe to overcome the energy crisis and would like to see um, bigger tankers come to our ports so that ports in the north of Europe would, re would receive smaller tankers and it would help to decongest the maritime afflux of the LNG, uh, of the gas, liquid fair gas to Europe. So I think that Portugal um, is really trying to be part of the solution, is trying to solve uh, a very old issue for Portugal, is, is that is to be better connected to the rest of Europe. And I would say that the French president's uh, words um, are something that are, uh, really have, have to do with the process and not with the political issue. Mm -hmm. Very good indeed. Uh, kind of is uh, a really ex uh, acceptable explanation. Mr. Howley, we all know that Russia is using the energy sector as leverage or even as a weapon against all European countries. But do you think there is another solution for Russia to avoid sanctions by not using this energy card? I believe this is the only key to fight back uh, against these sanctions. Don't you agree on that? Well, the sanctions preceded the Russian cutback. The Russians had negotiated for many years and then built a pipeline that's already there called Nord Stream 2. There's a certain amount of hypocrisy, which I, I don't hold Portugal responsible for it, but the European Union. What they're talking about is importing liquefied natural gas from the United States. This is part of the corruption of U.S. policies that goes back to Trump and, and the Biden administration trying to shut off gas from Russia using Ukraine as an excuse, and then shipping U.S. gas there. Now, the other part of the hypocrisy is how is this a transition? You're still talking about a pipeline in two or three years that will be using natural gas. That's not part of the so-called green transition. So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy here that has to do with the kind of corruption which is related to the U.S. European Union domination of world markets, which is collapsing. There's a whole new order developing in, in Eurasia. Uh, Argentina, for example, just announced they'll be joining the BRICS countries. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization is meeting and bringing in more Asian nations. The Chinese are engaged in infrastructure development in Africa. Meanwhile, Europe is funding wars in, in uh, the war in Ukraine and austerity against its population. So I see the, this hypocrisy as one of the key elements of this Anglo-American unipolar order. And I think the rest of the world is moving against it. I think at some point the Europeans are going to wake up and say, why are we suffering so the United States can sell more of its own gas to Europe? Mm -hmm.
Quite understood. Now let's tackle from Portugal to Germany. The German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has had a phone or rather a telephone conversation with the Russian President Vladimir Putin, whom he has urged him to seek a diplomatic solution in the war in Ukraine. Scholz has urged Putin to facilitate a ceasefire in Ukraine and has asked him to withdraw Russian troops from Ukraine, as well as respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of his neighboring country. Now, Mr. Howley, before talking about this phone call, uh, I have uh, a parliamentarian, or rather a uh, PM on, in the German uh, parliament. She said that we do have kind of a stupid government in the country. We impose sanctions on Germany, but we don't have alternative. Let's hear it. Mr. Habeck, unfortunately, it's not the same in business audits and politics. Unfortunately, a minister who no longer delivers does not actually have to fight for bankruptcy. You are the best example for this. But a company that can no longer sell anything because of the high prices will disappear from the market. And that means if we don't stop the energy price explosion, then German industry with its strong, small and medium-sized companies will soon only be a reminder of the good old days. Mr. Ali, how can you explain this phone call at, at this time? Isn't an awkward move from Charles after weaponizing Ukraine as much as he could? Now he is calling the Russian sites and calling him to withdraw. And just to add this, the German, uh, the MP said last week, we have most of the stupid government in Europe. We impose sanctions on the only energy supplier we do have without looking for any alternative. Well, I think Sarah Wagenknecht was absolutely right in her characterization of Habeck, who's the economics minister, who's a Green Party member, that he is driven by ideology and Russophobia. Uh, look, look, let's look at the situation in Germany. Schultz should look at the fact that Germany, as one of the signers of the Minsk II Accord, never insisted that Ukraine live up to the agreement to negotiate in the Donbass during the five or six years that that had been signed by Ukraine, Russia, Germany, and France. So in a certain sense, the, the Germans are participating in creating the circumstances for the Russian operation. Now, secondly, uh, Baerbach, the foreign minister, made a statement the other day, which I think is resonating, creating anger in the German population. She said, we'll continue to arm Ukraine and do what it takes to win this war, quote, no matter what my German voters think, unquote. Is that democracy? Is that democratic? And let me remind her, she only got 14.8% of the vote in the last election. So you have radical ideology dominating the German government, blaming Putin, when in fact the Germans could have done more to stop the United States and the United Kingdom from pushing Putin to make the decision that he had no choice but to invade. So I think the situation in Germany is, is going to be a, a possible point of change. I, I don't think the government's about to fall, but there's a great deal of dissatisfaction in the German population beneath the surface. And we're seeing it rise to the surface in other countries, including Italy, where they have new, they'll have elections mm -hmm. to choose a new government later this month. Quite understood. Uh, Ms. Sandra, if the war, the so-called special military operation, goes on for a long period than it already takes, uh, with this energy crisis, uh, in this energy crisis that's crippled Europe, move to harm other sectors. After all, it all comes down to money in fields like health and education. Well, something that we know from the economists is that inflation, inflation is something very contagious. So inflation in energy prices will also spread to other uh, goods uh, in the economies. And if the war uh, uh, lasts for, for a long time, uh, public opinion will be very important uh, to support the measures and, um, and actually, let's recall that the European economy, uh, in terms of the EU bloc, is already an economy of war. So uh, the measures uh, that have, are being decided are an alternative to direct and frontal war with, with Russia. Let's not forget that. This is what is at stake. Um, so the, the, the decisions taken by the EU um, are uh, decisions that uh, make 
uh, um, direct war with Russia uh, less probable. And uh, let's think that this is this is a better alternative probably uh, than a direct war. So, um, so yes, I would I would somehow disagree with some points that Mr. Schlanger just mentioned. I think that hypocrisy uh, was there in the past, but I think that uh, this war is a definitive uh, wake up call for the European Union. And um, even if it will be difficult and take some time, I think that uh, uh, changes that we are seeing are already historical. And concerning uh, the, the German population, and uh, this is a key because Germany in this energy crisis is one of the, is, is one of the first countries to be highly affected and uh, in terms of its economy. So uh, I think that the, the tensions and the pressure that the, the, um, the government and the population is, is, uh, is feeling is something that is very important to follow, to understand what will be uh, the evolution of the measures that uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. van der Leyen announced this morning. Mm -hmm. Quite understood and very good in point. Uh, to this and the ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Miss Sandra Fernandez from Portugal, uh, Mr. Henry Schlenga, as always from Germany. Thank you ever so much for your thorough analysis and for your participation with us. To this and ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. Take care of yourself. Have a blessed day.